in contemporary times, we will oftentimes think of artifacts as being presented by an individual and created by an individual. And that does happen more now than it ever has in the past. Certainly we have individual uh, content creators posting things to YouTube and to, to, um, TikTok and, and different things like that, much like this video you're watching now created by and, and uh, presented by an individual. But the truth is, you know, these videos that I'm creating as much as I would love for them to go viral or whatever, they're going to have a pretty limited impact or they're, they're going to be maybe impactful to the people who are watching them, but that number is going to be fairly small compared to the, the videos and, and other artifacts that we see in, in mass production and mass media. So those are created by an organization. You're talking about films, TV shows, radio programs, even, even the biggest podcasts have a team of people behind them. There may be one person on camera or a couple people on camera, but they are represented and supported by a support staff of hundreds or thousands of people. Right. And when that happens, it impacts the, the artifact, the, the fact that it's created by an organization impacts that artifact, the way it's presented, what is shared, all of that kind of stuff. So with that in mind, we're going to take a look at organizational analysis as, as a part of uh, critical media studies and, and look at that particular perspective and that particular lens and the way that organizations impact the content that is created and the artifacts that are presented. So very briefly, organizational analysis examines artifacts from the perspective that media is inherently influenced by the organization creating it much the same way that if you, if you had an individual artist, you have an individual painter, that that painting is going to, to reflect that person's perspective and their ideals and their morals and their whatever, it's going to carry a part of them with it, right? An artifact that's created by an organization will carry the same things from that organization. You know, if you have an ultimately a very conservative organization, a very, you know, very, of very conservative morals, that's the kind of artifact they are going to create as opposed to, um, a, a very liberal or very, very, you know, free organization. They're going to create something totally different. That artifact is going to, going to represent the same values and principles as that organization. So uh, artifacts, need to be examined then from the perspective that the media is inherently influenced, that artifact is inherently influenced by the organization creating it. So some of the major premises in organizational analysis include, first of all, that organizations have structures. Organizations are by definition structured entities. Okay? They don't just exist freely and they're not just, you know, uh, roaming around. The organizations have structures and they're represented in a couple different ways. First of all, you have hierarchy, this idea of hierarchy where there is a, a, a power structure, right? Where, where one person is over another, has power over another and, and somebody report, everybody has a boss, right? Everybody reports to someone. There's a structural hierarchy at play there where one person is going to have more influence, more say, more power based on their position. You also have this idea of differentiation where uh, in an organization, people are specialized into different areas. So if we look at a, a major movie studio, for example, you have the on-screen talent, right? You have actors and that's what they specialize in. Those are people who have that skill, that ability to act. Then you have people directing them who have the ability to, to put people in the right positions and, and have this overall vision for the, the, the film, right? You have producers who are kind of behind the scenes, putting all these pieces together and making larger scale decisions, but you also then have you have craft services. You have the, the people who are making food. You have accountants of all kinds. You have, you have all kinds of people that are, that are behind the scenes. You have executives, you have marketing people, all these things. And they're all specialized in these kind of silos, right? Where they, they focus specifically on what they are good at. So organizations are great. That's great for organizations. They can bring together people with these specialties and, and have them specialize in these expertises. But at the same time, it does divide up the work quite a bit. You know, you don't have everybody looking at all the things necessarily. And so, um, anyway, there's differentiation. There's, there's specialization within organizations. You also have formalization. There's a, there's an etiquette to these things. There are a way that they, things are done, right? There's a, a way that things are presented and there's kind of an ethos around that organization. So you have a formalization of procedures. You have formalization of, of interactions and interpersonal relationships and things within an organization. So organizations have structures in all of these different kinds of ways. There's different ways that they're specialized and different ways that they're organized. Right? 
So that in, that's a major thing to keep in mind that organizations have structures and that's going to impact the ultimate artifact here. The structure of each organization is going to be unique as well. If we look at one movie studio, it's going to be different than another movie studio, right? We see that in that there are some who focus on blockbusters and, and major franchises and things. And there are some who focus on little indie films, or art house films or dramas or, you know, the, the kinds that win awards for, for, for actors and things like that. Um, but the structure of each organization is different. Some are more formalized, some are less formalized. Some have uh, more levels of hierarchy with, you know, lots of different layers and uh, others don't. They're flattened organizations where there's very little, uh, few, very few layers between the ultimate decision makers and the people kind of at the, at the lower realms of the hierarchy, right? They're, every organization is unique. If you think about different jobs that you've had or different places that you've worked, they're all unique. Every organization is different. And we need to keep that in mind as well. And that, that uniqueness then, because they're all unique, that affects the output. So all of those things that are unique, the hierarchy, the differentiation, the formalization, the structure of these organizations, because it's different in every organization, that impacts what you see on the other end, right? I remember a famous story about uh, the Lord of the Rings trilogy, the original Peter Jackson, Lord of the Rings trilogy. He shopped those around forever, really wanted to make these movies. And he shopped it around forever and he shopped it around as a trilogy. And then uh, many places said, well, that's just too much. This is too, why would you do three films? So he eventually put it together as like a two film package, right? So, okay, we can do this in two films. And then he went to the, the studio that ended up making it. And they, they kind of looked at him and said, but, why are you making two? There's three books. Why would you not have three? Why would it, you know, why would you condense it into two when there are three books? And he said, oh, great, we can do three. But because that, they had a different, different perspective, they had a different organization and different ethos and different way of doing things and looking at things. And so they viewed things differently. They could see that vision differently than the other studios could because they're different. Every organization is different. Okay. So these are the major premises that organizations have structures. Those structures are unique. And because of that uniqueness, it's going to affect the output um, that you eventually see from whatever organization you're looking at. In a contemporary sense, we can look at a couple of things as well. There are very, a couple of very important contemporary perspectives that we need to consider. First is the gate kind of gatekeeping function that media plays. So essentially, in short, and we're not going to get into great detail because there's a lot we can talk about with gatekeeping just in and of itself. But gatekeeping basically means these large organizations and, and another one we talked about, you know, conglomeration and concentration of these things. So you have a few organizations that are basically deciding what gets made, what gets heard, what gets said, what kind of movies are, are being made, what kind of TV shows are getting on the air. And so we have this gatekeeping function where these organizations are making decisions about what's going to be, what's eventually going to be put out and, and what perspective we're going to get. Right. Um, we see this um, in, in a lot of different ways and we'll get into that. We'll get into here in a few minutes, but, uh, but there's definitely a gatekeeping function, especially in modern media. And that's always been true in the media, uh, but, the, but that's especially important in today's media where we're especially fragmented in the way that we uh, consume and view media. Also keep in mind that we have large organizations, these huge conglomerations and concentrations and lots of, uh, lots of intersection and integration of media. So there are lots of hands touching every product that comes out. Every artifact is, you know, very rarely is for a major media artifact. Is it going to be just one person's vision and one person's product? It's going to have been touched by, you know, by, by all kinds of hands, by the marketing department, by the accounting department, by the legal department, by the executives, by the, you know, uh, and then the creative people as well. So there, there's a lot of hands. And by the time, you know, think about how we think about sometimes a, a bill that starts out in Congress. And then by the time it gets out and passed into law, it looks like something totally different because, you know, you had a, a one or two, a few people that put this build together. And then you get hundreds of people that get their hands on it and add things and subtract things. And it's hardly recognizable at the other end, right? That's true of artifacts in major organizations as well. It's one of the impacts that organizations have is that it puts a lot of hands on every artifact. And then we have to think about the impact of social media as well, which is a newer thing, right? Um, it's a newer thing. 20 years ago, we didn't have to think about this or really have that much impact on, on, uh, from social media, but now we do, we have individual creators of content, individual people be able, being able to express their opinion and, and, uh, and it's, you know, def define it, influence others, um, based on their opinion and, and 
So we have some people who are influencers. So we have the impact of social media in that way, kind of giving other people some input and, and, uh, and on this as well. And organizations are cognizant of that and paying attention to that. So now that we have a sense of what organizational analysis is kind of all about, let's take a look at some of the questions that are commonly asked uh, by someone who would be engaging in uh, organizational analysis uh, or engaging in critical media studies with the lens of organizational analysis. So first of all, we ask, as always, who created this artifact, whether it's an individual, whether it's an organization, whatever we want to know, who is behind this artifact and, and where it came from. Then we also want to ask ourselves, what's the purpose and the values of this organization in this instance, because we're engaging in organizational analysis. The artifact comes from an organization. So we want to ask, who is that organization? What is their purpose? What are they trying to accomplish? What are their values? What do we know about them? So we're going to dig a little bit into who is this organization and what are they all about? So how did this purpose and values impact the creation and presentation of this artifact? And so once we know who created the artifact and what that organization is all about, then we can start to make some deductions about what are the purpose and values and, and how did those impact what we see in front of us, what, what that artifact or artifact became and what the eventual output was there. And then what's the agenda behind that artifact? What was the purpose of releasing it, of producing it, of putting it out there in the world? What are they hoping to accomplish with this artifact? So these are some of the basic questions. And then this can spin off in a variety of different directions as we're going to find out here. But um, so we want to ask some of these broader questions and then see how they apply to specific artifacts. So let's take a look at a couple of different instances here. Um, the first one we're going to look at is the case of Norm MacDonald, um, the comedian Norm MacDonald, when he was on SNL, Saturday Night Live back in the 90s. Um, he was the uh, a, a cast member on SNL for many years and then became the host of the Weekend Update feature on Saturday Night Live and did that for a number of years. And as part of that, he really became fixated uh, at the conclusion of the O.J. Simpson murder trial. When O.J. Simpson was found not guilty, uh, Norm became pretty fixated on the fact that he believed O.J. was guilty and that the trial was a joke and, and that the verdict was a sham and so forth. And and so he made that very clear almost every week on on weekend update. He, he would make a joke about how O.J. was guilty or how he actually did it or whatever. And at the time, the 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 president of um, of NBC happened to be a friend of O.J. Simpson's and did not like uh, this this feature of of Weekend Update. And he let it be known that he did not like it. And he wanted Norm Macdonald to stop commenting on the O.J. Simpson trial and stop saying that O.J. was guilty and so forth. And Norm basically refused. He said no. And as a result, then was fired, not only from and they first was pulled from as anchor of Weekend Update, and then eventually, after a few more weeks, was fired from SNL altogether and uh, and removed from the show, never came back and and so lost his job eventually because of this. And this is, you know, again, not necessarily an organizational decision so much as an individual decision, but we see the hierarchy within NBC at that time. We see the, the formality, the differentiation, but this, the president was able to make that decision and say, look, if he's not going to stop and clearly he's not, then I want him gone. And so as an organization, they basically let it be known that they were not only going to follow the lead of this, this leader, but that they were essentially tacitly endorsing the not guilty verdict for OJ Simpson. Um, but, but really kind of in, in the view of many people letting the tail wag the dog in the sense of he had one person with a personal connection to the person in, that was being, uh, um, talked about in this feature, making the decision for the organization and then forcing that organization then to say, no, we're not doing this. And, and pulling the plug on, on that, the person, the, uh, on Norm Macdonald in this instance. So that's kind of a, a very specific, um, instance uh, that we see where an organization has really um, pervaded its, its values and essentially those are one person, but we see this also in contemporary times in the, for example, the fragmentation of the news media in cable news. So you have essentially three primary, um, news media outlets in cable news, Fox news, MSNBC, and CNN. And we see how this has grown, first of all, out of the fragmentation of the media. Um, the fact that you used to have more of a generalized news program on network news that was more broadly appealing. But now with the fragmentation of the media, we see um, news channels, uh, you know, that are, you know, theoretically news channels are supposed to be unbiased, right? They're supposed to be you know, uh, presenting just the facts, right? Well, we know that's not the case. Not, there's nothing unbiased about any media outlet, but 
But certainly we've taken this to the way opposite direction of this with the fragmentation of the media in the news media outlets where we have, you know, Fox News, which is ultra conservative. OK, and this is I'm saying this without politics entering into it for me personally. Fox News is objectively really conservative, like ultra conservative. Right. And it appeals to that. Again, they're they're media is here to make money. So that's what they're trying to do. They're trying to appeal in a fragmented media uh, society. They're trying to appeal to a specific group that of ultra conservative people and people who espouse those values. So the values of Fox news are, you know, the values of conservatism, they would say, and the, you know, those types of things. So they have a very specific outlook. MSNBC has kind of a, a opposite outlook. They're, they're kind of the liberal side of things, right? In this fragmented world, CNN tries to straddle that fence a little bit. They, they age a little bit toward the liberal side, but they're really trying uh, recently anyway, to, to move back toward strictly in the middle where they're focusing strictly on journalism and things. So, uh, and, you know, we can argue about how successful they've been with that. Um, and the ratings indicate that that's not as successful as taking a stand on one side or the other. Now, journalistically, sir, CNN's probably in the strongest position of the three, but in terms of media, uh, we see that when an organization allows its, its values and purpose to come through, um, then that is that draws people in a fragmented media society toward them. So it's interesting to watch these, though. If you watch the same story being reported on all three of these uh, networks, it's interesting the different uh, takes that you will get from them. And that is really the kind of the crux of organizational analysis, this idea that even though they're all ostensibly news organizations here to present the facts and, and keep the public updated, first of all, that gatekeeping function of what they what they report on, what stories they choose to tell and 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 make available to their publics. And then also the, the spin that they put on those things um, is, is really interesting um, in terms of critical analysis. And we can that's you know one area we can really easily see this impact of organization in terms of organizational analysis. We can see the impact of the organization and its its values and its purpose uh, shining through in terms of the way they report the news and what they report and the way they present these ideas and the, the publics that they attempt to to which they're attempting to appeal. OK, so hopefully this gives you a better idea of what we mean by organizational analysis. The fact that any artifact that comes from an organization is going to be reflective of that organization's purpose, of their values. And we need to keep that in mind and be able to, uh, to, to identify that when, when it comes up and when we see it. If you have questions about organizational analysis or any of the other critical perspectives that we're going to be talking about here, please feel free to email me. I'd love to hear from you there and, and chat with you about that um, or in the comments or however you want to do it. Um, but in the meantime, I hope this gives you, again, one more perspective, one more you know, set of glasses, if you wish, of lenses that we're going to put on as we examine these artifacts in the media from a critical perspective.